Good morning. So we're back to we hit eighty today. So that's pretty summary. Welcome to those who are visiting. I got my family here and uh they've been up anniversary celebration, did a lot of work yesterday and, and uh just been great to be together and it's great to be able to worship together today. Uh Morgan, where you are. There you are. Yep. I know Pastor said that it's gonna feel like summer today, but I want to remind everybody that the fall festival will be September thirtieth. So not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday. There is a sign-up sheet in the back for both um, RSVP if you're going to be here for dinner and also for signing up to help with games, um, donate some prizes, that kind of thing back there too. So I invite you all to come to our fall festival. Um, we will be having dinner, which will begin about 5.30, and then we'll open up the gym for games and carnival things um, about 7 o'clock, maybe a little earlier, depending on how long it takes to eat. Thank you. Thank you. So if you win one prize, you get the dog, and if you win a second prize, you get a bun, and third, third time through, you can have chili. <laughs> uh, Bible study this week for adults on Wednesday night. Kids club, I am assuming, on Wednesday night. Yep, okay. Uh, any other announcements that need to be made? Okay, if not, we'll call on the praise team. Good morning. Good morning. Psalm 106, verse 1, tells us to praise the Lord, to give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. I'm reminded that as we gather as a church to worship, we are not only gathering as a body here, but a body of Christians throughout the world, throughout ages, and our song reminds us that as God has created all of creation, we join with heavens and the earth to praise the Lord. I invite you to stand. Let's praise the Lord together. You made the starry host, you traced the mountain peaks, you paid the evening skies with water. It is your throne from desert to the sea. All nature testifies your splendor. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Sing his greatness, all creation. Praise the Lord.
Let symphonies resound, let drums and choirs ring out. All heaven hear the sound of worship. Let every nation ring to honor to the King. A roar of harmonies, eternal praise the Lord, praise the Lord, sing His praise. church body and praise the Lord, but to think of all of creation and all the Christians throughout this world praising the Lord together. It's a beautiful picture, beautiful picture. As we come before the Lord, our holy God, let us confess our need for God's mercy. Almighty God, our maker and redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean and that we have sinned against you in thought word and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and ask you for Christ's sake. Grant us forgiveness of all our sins and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word to the end that by your grace we may come to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ. Speaking of God's infinite mercy, Ephesians 2, 4, it says, God being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us, made us alive together in Christ. Let's sing about that. What love could remember no wrongs we have done Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into the sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. darkness new every morn our sins they are many his mercy is more would patience would wait as we constantly roam what father so tender is calling us home he welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins, they are many. of kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost we stood neath the dead we could never afford our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord his mercy is more Our 
sins they are many his mercy praise the Lord. is more praise the Lord his mercy is more stronger than darkness to every more our sins they are many his mercy is more want to thank you for your mercy, for your persistence, for your patience, for everything that you do for us, Lord, that you keep following us even though we keep running from you, Lord, that you love us so much, and that is why you laid down your life for us, and that is why we can trust you, Lord. Please help us to remember. Amen. Amen. Our Old Testament reading comes from Hosea chapter 13. Verse 14. I shall ransom them from the power of Sheol. I shall redeem them from death. O death, where are your plagues? O Sheol, where is your sting? Compassion is hidden from my eyes. And our New Testament reading from Colossians 1 24. Or the second chapter, verse 3. Colossians 1 24, verses 2, verse 3. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sakes, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Here is the reading of God's word. You may be seated. At this time, I'll invite uh, Kyle Les Westlake forward for a children's message, and then after that, we'll call the ushers forward for receiving our tithes and offerings. Right, I think that's on. I'm going to scoot right here in the middle. All right, so there's a step there. All right, let me get my things all set up here. Everyone getting settled in? Oh, boy, hopefully I brought enough fruit snacks. That's okay. You guys can share, right? There's only two packs in here. All right. Nope. Straight to jail. All right. So I want to talk to you guys about my friend here. This friend, her name is Olivia. Just chosen at random. I couldn't think of a better name. She just looks like an Olivia. All right. Oh, and there happens to be an Olivia here. Liv, could you come here and hold this for me? So this is the way God has designed us, right? Perfect. You know, you got to come here. Can you scoot down? Perfect. Okay, a vessel for his spirit, right? An image of God. But then sometimes Olivia, ha you know, might do something like maybe not listen to her parents the first time, right? Sin entered the world way back with Adam and Eve, and all of us, right, have dealt with it. But Olivia, let's see. Let's just think of a little sin, like maybe not taking the trash out when dad asks you and then trying to hide it from me. Come here. Let's just see what a little baby sin does. We're not going to do a big sin. We're just going to do a little baby sin. What do you? I don't know what's going to happen. Let, let's just try. A baby sin probably won't hurt anything, right? Just a little baby sin. 
Oh, look at what? Whoa! Let's see. Are there any babies that were sleeping that are no longer sleeping? Okay, we did pretty good. Okay, whoa, 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 Liv, Liv, it's okay. You messed up a little bit, but you know, I think the Bible's pretty clear that you should be able to do, handle this yourself. So, here you go. Here's some tape. Here's some tape and a stapler. Come here. I need you to fix this. You messed it up. You fix it. You can do this, okay? You got it. Oh, here's some tape, bud. That might help. You can staple that together. You just take a minute. Okay, and luckily for us, right, Olivia might be the, she's the only person who's ever made a mistake, right? So we don't have to worry about that. Can anybody read this top line here? I think the Bible says only Olivia has sinned and, and nobody else has to worry about anything, right? Okay, let's, can you read that top, the green one? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay, I was wrong. Apparently all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? That means your mom and dad, your brothers and sisters, Olivia, poor Olivia. Liv, how's that going, by the way? Have you fixed your balloon yet? Okay, the head's gone, yep. Okay, even your pastor, right, and really smart people, and really your grandmas and grandpas were all sinners, right? And just like Olivia, one little sin pops our balloon, and we can't. Liv, can you blow that back up for us? You, you try. Stand up and try blowing it back up. It should work. You fixed it. Yep, come on. Nope, stand up and try blowing it up. Let's see. You fixed it. It should work. Liv, stand up and try blowing it up. Okay, Olivia, you got yourself into this situation. You can fix it and get out. Blow it up. Let's see. Give it a big old blow. See what happens. Perfect. Okay, well, <laughs> it's not looking good for you. Okay, 1 John 1, 8 and 9 says, if we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us, right? All of us have sinned, all of us, just like Olivia, have popped our own balloons, right? And God doesn't say, well, you should be able to fix them and get back to that perfect spirit-filled being, right, that we were designed to be, filled with his Holy Spirit. Now we're just a balloon that's taped up. And like that stapler, a lot of people think that they can just be a good person, right? That's like the stapler. That's how silly that is. Oh, I'm a good person. You know, I can fix my balloon. Or I've got tape. I go to church. I've got tape. I can fix my own balloon, right? That's not how salvation works for us. God sent Jesus, his only son, to die on the cross for us, right? He became sin for us, and he doesn't even fix our balloons. He does something even better. He, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, the old has passed away, just like Olivia's balloon. That's no more. But behold, a new one has come. Where'd my new one go? Oh, no. Pass it up here. Pass it up. Look at this. A perfect yellow balloon, right? This is what God does for us. No matter what we do, no matter how hard Olivia tried, she can't, she can't fix this by herself, right? But by the grace of God... Right? He gave us a plan, and all we need to do is confess our sins, right? trust in Jesus to be our Savior, and it's a free gift, right? and it's only by the grace of God. It doesn't matter how many tools we have or how good we are at fixing things. Salvation is not something for us to do for ourselves, is it? It's for God to give to us as a free gift if we only believe. All right, I am going to pray, and then we can maybe hand out some fruit snacks. All right, dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your gift of salvation. We thank you that your promises are kept and that you give us your word and that you love us so much and that you want us to be with you forever. Amen. All right. All right, you crazies. Come grab one thing of fruit snacks. Nope. Just one fruit snack.
I see the stars with a mighty thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great thou art, how great thou art. Greater thou art, and for us great I sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. sent him to die I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sing my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. for reminding us of our great God and the picture that we can sing of how great he is here and when we get to heaven we'll continue to sing that. Uh, 
our song before the message also accentuates that we have a great God, especially through Jesus Christ, who even while we are here on this earth, we can lay our burdens upon. We can, we can come to in prayer. We can find a solace in Jesus Christ. Let's stand and sing together. to us this time as we dig into your word and speak through pastor. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We're considering this morning the topic of prayer and specifically of persistence in prayer. And uh, I chose that that hymn before the message, hopefully as a as a positive motivator to prayer, um, and and to realize that uh, the Lord would be a friend to us. The text on which I base my message to you this morning is found in Luke 18. We'll read and consider verses one through eight. Then Jesus told this parable. To his disciples to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. 
There was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I'll see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see to it that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? On earth. I read recently of a man who was out flying his little Cessna, I believe it was a 180. He called the, the tower when he had a little bit of a problem. He said, Pilot to tower, I'm 300 miles from the airport, 600 feet above ground, I'm out of fuel, and I'm descending rapidly. Please advise, over. Tower to pilot, replied the dispatcher. Repeat after me. Our Father, who art in heaven, and you get the rest. Well, he didn't have much time left, did he? To be prayerful. But at least in those moments that he did have left to him, he, he was prayerful. Now, Jesus tells us a parable here in the opening verses of Luke chapter 18. And what occasioned this parable is that he wanted to instruct those who pray that they should always pray and not give up. And it's really more serious than that, my friends, because the phrase that's translated pray and not give up could also be translated to pray and not become worthless. Because the Greek word here is kakeo, and it means to be worthless or corrupt. Prayerlessness is a worthless thing. We need to be prayerful. In fact, Jesus is concerned about the practice of prayer throughout the 18th chapter of Luke. He begins with the parable of the persistent widow. Then he goes on and he makes reference to the tax collector and the Pharisee in verses 9 through 14 and compares and contrasts their prayers and their attitudes. Then he, he record, or it's recorded for us about parents who were bringing little children to Jesus that he should bless them. And, and the whole idea there is one of prayerfulness again. They're coming and they're seeking from God. Then in verses 18 through 29, and I preached recently on this, on this same parable, or a, not a parable, but account of an encounter with Jesus and a man known as a rich young ruler. And finally, in verses 35 through 43 of Luke chapter 18, he makes reference to the blind beggar and his prayer for mercy. Now, Jesus, in this 18th chapter of Luke, doesn't attempt to give an exhaustive dissertation on prayer. It isn't, you know, memorize chapter 18 and you'll know everything there is to know about prayer. Prayer is much more than just what's contained in these verses. And it's also important when we think about this parable that I just read to you, that we understand the context of the parable. If you look back in chapter 17, verses 20 through 37, the topic there has to do with the second coming of Jesus. And Jesus is emphasizing then in our parable that this prayer or that prayerfulness should be affected by the hope that we have as believers that he who came once will come again. And the parable before us is a picture of the church and its conflict with the adversary as she awaits the coming of the Lord. We all have issues about prayer. There are those who would oppose us. But I find it 
I find it unsettling, to be honest with you. The question that Jesus asks in verse 8 of the text, will the Son of Man find faith when he comes again? Hmm. Will he? Will he find faith on the earth? Will he find faith in my heart? Will he find me faithful in my life? And how about you? I can't answer the question for you. But I pray that you too might be unsettled this morning as you consider the importance of prayer, the need to pray and to pray and not give up, to pray and not get worthless. The widow, I think, represents the church. The adversary is Satan. The judge is God. And I think there's a, a real risk that Jesus takes here in comparing God to this judge. The, the comparison between God and, judge, and the judge, really, for the most part, is one of antithesis, isn't it? What the judge is, God isn't. There's some important differences between God and the judge. And so this study or this comparison is really one of contrast for us today. You look at the judge. He's evil. God is holy and just. In a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. In Revelation 15.3, we read great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. What a difference between the two. There's another uh, difference here in that the judge really didn't give two hoots for the woman or for her cry for justice. But God does care for us. And he invites us to bring our troubles to him. Cast all your anxiety on him. We're told in 1 Peter 5, 7. Why? Because he cares for you. Now the judge was a mere man. He didn't know this woman's request before it was brought to him. But the fact is that God knows everything even before we ask Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount made this declaration. Your father knows what you need before you ask him. But we're invited, we're even commanded to come to him in prayer, to be prayerful people, to bring our situations to him when we have problems, to ask him to help bring resolve. The judge gave in because the woman kept crying out to him. God, on the other hand, isn't impressed with verbosity or repetition. And he doesn't give in to our requests if we'll just keep asking long enough. That's not what's being taught in this parable. <laughs> I have a son who's a, who's a postal employee, and so I'm going to dedicate this little illustration to him. The Associated Press carried an interesting story about a group of post office customers who succeeded in speeding up some slow-moving service. One man said it was like watching grass grow. There were 26 patrons jammed into two lines. They realized they weren't getting enough attention, so a 73-year-old man in their midst organized the group. And in an uncommon show of unity, the 26 shouted out together, We want service! And within two minutes, a clerk comes out from behind the wall and says, Next? <laughs> like nothing had happened. Well, the customers realized they were on to something good, so they tried it again, and you guessed it, another clerk appeared. And an amused customer summed up the situation like this. He said, I got through that line in four minutes. He says, I've never seen anything like it. Now, I've been in some long lines in the post office. I've never tried to unionize my fellow customers. 
But uh, that, that's an interesting story. God isn't like that. He isn't like By the way, I'm sorry, Zach. I apologize. Again, from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, verse 7, we read, When you pray, don't keep on babbling like pagans. They think they'll be heard because of their many words. God hears and answers. And he doesn't have to be summoned from behind a wall. He's always accessible to us. Paul had an experience where God answered his prayer, and it, it, it wasn't exactly what he prayed for, but he realized that it was the best thing because God always does what's best for us. He said, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations. He said, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. May that be our attitude when God would give us an answer. And maybe it isn't the answer that we originally desired, but he can work in us too, a satisfaction with his will and to recognize that his grace, which was sufficient for Paul, is also sufficient for each of us. And may our boast be about Christ's power. God isn't some sort of slot machine. You know, you keep plugging the coins in sooner or later, it'll pay off. Um, he's not like that. That's not what he's all about. It's interesting that the judge gave in to the woman, and what he really says here is, I'm going to answer her because she's given me a black eye. She didn't have much power, but I'm told, and if somebody wants to come up here, I can just, you know, start while I'm preaching, but you keep banging away in the same place, you're going to get a bruise. And her eye, or his eye, would, would turn black if she didn't give up and quit. He didn't wait. He finally went ahead and answered. Now, there are also a couple of, I think, important similarities here. First of all, there has, it has to do with power and authority. That judge had the power, he had the authority to grant that widow's request. And the truth is that God has all power and authority to answer any of our requests of him. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. Ephesians 3.20. And in both cases, there were delays in answering. But there's a difference between God and the judge at this point. The judge had to be worn down in order to vindicate the widow, but not God. The judge looked on the widow as a Pain in the neck is good for nothing. But Jesus tells us in the first verse that God looks on those who give up in prayer as good for nothing. We need to pray. It needs to be a persistent habit in our lives. What can we learn from the widow? Well, I think we learn the right exercise of faith in our own life. To recognize that it needs to be a priority for each of us. David Wenham in his book, The Parables of Jesus, writes, Prayer is commonly understood in the modern world as a psychologically therapeutic exercise, benefiting the worship or worshiper but having little other effect. Accordingly, we do not make it a priority. You believe in God? Everybody's head's going to go up and down, right? Do you believe in God? Do you believe he hears? Do you believe he answers? Do you believe you need to keep on? It's more than a psychological thing, friends. It's a practice that God's people 
need to be involved in on a daily basis because the fact of the matter is we have lots of needs. And he has lots of power. He has lots of authority. Sometimes his answer will be to change our hearts. Sometimes it'll be to change the hearts of others. But he will work. There's also a matter of perspective in all of this. That widow had no power, but she did have a right to come before the judge. And as God's children, so do we. Therefore, brothers, we read in Hebrews 10, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. What he's done for us in the past, justifying us, giving us new birth, indwelling us with his Holy Spirit, motivate us. And we need to respond affirmatively then. It motivates us to communicate with our God, to be prayerful with him. Now, prayer is really the, the, the confession of our helplessness. It's our confession of utter dependence upon him. It's our conviction that he cares for us and that he has the ability to deal with our needs. Prayer is an expression on our part of our weaknesses, but it's also a weapon of divine power. Now, there's no power in prayer. If you have one of those plaques on your wall, take it down. There's no power in prayer. There's power in the one to whom we pray. Big difference. Big difference. God hears, and he's able to answer and he does. And our prayer should simply be, your will be done. No power in prayer, but it puts us in touch with him who has all power. I remember some years ago helping a good friend of mine work on a house. They were, and he's a, he's a professional contractor. And his dad was still working, and his dad was up into his 70s at that time. He could drive a 16-penny nail down into the wood in three, three strokes. And it was in, and it was in tight. It would take me five or six, and on half of the nails, I'd have to stop and straighten it out, and, you know, and then give it another four or five pokes. Aren't you glad I'm not the one you pray to? Vindicating is her prayer. And again, remember the context. Jesus who came once will come again. When Jesus taught us the Lord's Prayer, he prayed, Thy kingdom come, even before any requests for daily matters. In prayer, we're not in opposition with God. We're not here just seeking our way. Prayer is an opportunity for us to be in fellowship with him, to experience another aspect of the gracious relationship that he offers us with him. There's a matter of protection in all of this. That woman had no advocate. We do. In 1 John 2, 1, we read, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. I don't know about you, but I'd rather have him than Superman on my side. Huh? Because God can do way more than leaping tall buildings with a single bound. 
He can provide. And he can stand before the Father as your advocate and mine. Think about this. He's on our side. And when he pleads in our defense, it's not because, well, Gary's been a pretty good boy this week. It was just, he just blew that one thing. No, 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 no. He says, Father, my righteousness, I give to him. He's covered. Hear his prayer for my sake. And God does. I think there's a, the, the principle of persistence here. Prayer is one of the best defenses we have against opposition or when, when we're in the face of, of trial. And again, remember the context. The ultimate vindication will be Christ's return. Will he come again? Come on. Will he come again? It's been a long time. Will he come again? Why? Amen. He said so. He doesn't lie. God does not lie. And our ultimate vindication will occur when he comes again. Paul says we'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye, becoming like him. Can you imagine what it's going to be like to be sinless? To be fit? To be able to spend eternity in his presence? To be in a place where we'll never be tempted again? So in the meantime, don't repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. 1 Peter 3.9 I'm told that standing at the South Pole is like being in the eye of a hurricane. It's deceivingly calm. The quietness seems inconsistent with the fact that mighty winds originate there. How's that possible? Well, as warm air from the equator flows in over the polar region, it becomes cold and dense, and it begins to sink to the frigid surface. Since the ice-covered plateau tapers off toward the oceans, and no mountains of any or any other obstacle stand in the way, gravity pulls that heavy cold air down those smooth stroke or slopes. And, and the wind will pick up tremendous speed as it moves northward toward the equator. Gradually again, it's heated by the sun, begins to rise, creates that circular pattern that drives the Earth's weather machine that is so vital for our existence. I don't care for a lot of wind when I'm fishing, and I never cared for much wind when I golf, what an idiot I grew up in North Dakota. It always blows out there. Um, <laughs> but we need the wind. We need all of God's daily provision. And he provides for us. For Christians, quiet times of prayer and worship also give rise to great power as God moves into our lives and moves through our lives into the lives of others. Oh, it might seem non-productive because nothing appears to be happening right then and there. And our urge is almost compulsive. You've got to move. Don't sit. You've got to do. Don't wait. You've got to work. You've got to worry. You've got to struggle. And yet at the heart of accomplishing things needs to be that regular experience of calm followed by the unobstructed flow of energy that God the Holy Spirit brings and puts to use. So I'm going to ask you a question as I close the message today. I'm going to ask you the question that Jesus asked. Will he find faith here on earth 
when he comes again. Will he find faith in me? Will he find faith in you? Will it be evident in a faithful life? May God work in us what is pleasing to him. And may he be glorified as he vindicates us and uses us and blows through the world into the lives of others. God help us to be faithful. God help us to pray and not give up. Amen. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you again for what you teach us through the parables, Lord Jesus. They're simple. They're not rocket science. And yet they teach truths that are just so profound, truths that we can forget, truths that that we need to be reminded of, truths that change our lives. Help us, Lord, to be faithful. And when you come again and we pray that it would be soon, Would you find faith in each and every one of us? In your name we pray. Amen. The text of our final song is a prayer. Let us uh, cry out to the Lord together, and as you are able, I invite you to stand. gentle Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by, Say
Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for coming today. Amen.